Thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's an honor to be able to present to you about osteoarthritis and an update on the latest guidelines. I want to thank the organizers of RUMACON 2021 for the kind invitation to be able to present to you. Um, before I begin, uh, these are my disclosures. And I also want to just outline the objectives for today. First of all, I'd like to summarize what we know about osteoarthritis currently and, and what the recommended guidelines are in terms of management. I'll also talk about some novel strategies for pain management in osteoarthritis and things that are in the pipeline and, and currently being considered for approval, as well as some novel strategies for potentially disease modification in osteoarthritis. It's an exciting time to be in osteoarthritis management, um, probably a uh, good cause for hope. So I'll hopefully be able to get that across to you today and, uh, and, and we'll move forward. So as everyone knows, osteoarthritis is by far the most common type of arthritis that we deal with in rheumatology. And this is no different around the world, although the prevalences can vary from region to region. The World Health Organization's Global Burden of Disease study continually monitors the prevalence of various diseases, especially complex chronic diseases like osteoarthritis. And I think there's a couple of things we can learn from this. The first is that no matter where you go in the world, osteoarthritis is quite common. But potentially what's more interesting is that even though osteoarthritis is associated with aging and is certainly more common in the elderly, Overall, osteoarthritis is actually starting much earlier in people's lives. And you can see between the ages of 20 and 40 is when we start to see an increase in the number of cases of osteoarthritis. And, and no matter what region in the world, this starts to peak around age 55. And so in fact, the majority of symptomatic osteoarthritis actually starts between the ages of 35 and 55. So not necessarily just a disease of aging. The other thing is that it causes a tremendous amount of disability and people live with this for many, many years. And so out of 290 or so different causes of chronic disability, osteoarthritis is in fact number 11 now on the list of all of these disorders. And you can see that has increased since 1990, now at number 11 on the list. And overall ranks higher than tuberculosis and heart disease in, in the entire world, both in developing and developed areas. Uh, in terms of the, the number of years lived with disability. And so this has an important impact on our patients. Lots of disability means poor mobility and poor quality of life as a result. So there's a huge need to do something about this. And I think this is outlined very nicely in a study that was done at Rush University in Chicago, showing that if you look at patient reported outcomes in people with osteoarthritis versus rheumatoid arthritis, you can see that the scores in terms of the severity of their symptoms, whether it's for the rapid three, for pain NRS scales, et cetera, is about the same at the first visit for osteoarthritis patients as it is for rheumatoid arthritis patients. But the key difference of course, is that we have lots of great tools available. And so people tend to improve with rheumatoid arthritis, whereas we don't have those same tools available to us in, uh, in, in rheumatology for managing osteoarthritis. And so their pain scores stay about the same. So this highlights the important need uh, for care for rheumatology patients. And I think this is why the Osteoarthritis Research Society International, led by Jill Hawker and Lynn March and a, and a large team of others, worked very hard to convince the S FDA in the United States that osteoarthritis is a major public health priority. And in fact, as a result of this, now osteoarthritis is considered for fast track status, meaning that if there is a drug that is being uh, put through the pipeline, that it'll be considered more urgently, say, than for other conditions. So that's a, a tremendous development as of 2017. Um, I live and work in Canada and practice here as a rheumatologist, and, and we obviously see osteoarthritis all the time as well as our other rheumatic diseases. Osteoarthritis occurs in about 14% of the adult population here in Canada. Um, but I wanted to contrast that with the experience in, in Pakistan as well. Um, it looks like prevalence is even higher in Pakistan, about 28% in the urban population and 25% in the rural population, uh, at least according to a study from about 20 years ago or so. And some factors that were uh, examined to see what is associated with osteoarthritis was also reported uh, in a study about 10 years ago now, a study out of a tertiary care hospital in Karachi. And so they looked at 100 patients visiting a tertiary care center and found that uh, certain risk factors that are known to increase the prevalence of osteoarthritis uh, 
strongly increase the, the risk of, of needing care in uh, tertiary care hospital. In particular, female sex were three times more likely to require care than males, uh, only 25% of the population there. And, uh, and of course, aging is an important risk factor as already mentioned. I think this el um, illustrates the same point that the Global Burden of Disease study did that, you know, the disease starts at a younger age than we think of. And actually, the number of people starts to tail off as you get into the later decades. And potentially that's because either people are going for joint replacement or other potential factors that were not measured in this study, but, uh, but highlights that people are particularly affected in their key working years. I wanted to talk about the American College of Rheumatology guidelines. These were updated in 2019 and really outlined for us the state of the evidence in terms of management for osteoarthritis, particularly in the hands, the hip, and the knees. So this was published uh, in Arthritis and Rheumatology in 2019, as I mentioned. So they followed a three-step process. They did a systematic review of the literature and looked at educational, behavioral, psychosocial, physical, mind, body, and pharmacologic therapies for osteoarthritis. And for simplicity, I'm just going to speak about these as non-pharmacologic management options and then pharmacologic management options. They applied the GRADE methodology. So this is used to rate the quality of the evidence that was reviewed. And then they had a panel that voted to reach consensus on what the management options are. And this consisted of rheumatologists, internists, patients, as well as physical and occupational therapists. And this is great that patients were being included. So to briefly summarize this, there were strong or conditional recommendations either for or against different management options. So to first look at the non-pharmacologic management options, strongly recommended interventions include exercise in general. And I think what we've realized about exercise overall is that exercise is helpful. And it probably doesn't matter as much about which form it's in as it does as to which form of exercise that the patient will actually be able to do. So for some people with late stage disease, being able to exercise in a pool or gentle exercises like walking, might be better than obviously exercise like running or things that might be higher impact. And so tailoring it to the patient is very important. Of course, we know that weight loss can be effective. And in fact, a very small amount, only 5% of body weight loss is really what's needed to achieve a clinically meaningful improvement in pain and function in patients with osteoarthritis. Knee braces in particular for knee osteoarthritis were specifically recommended um, for knee osteoarthritis, and, and it could be a neoprene sleeve brace, or it could be a physical unloader brace, and that has to again be tailored to the patient. Conditional recommendations are really conditional because the strength of the evidence wasn't uh, quite as strong as it was for the recommendations that were able to be strongly recommended. It doesn't mean that it's more or less effective, but just that the quality of the evidence may not have been as high. And so heat therapy in particular was conditionally recommended and some other interventions like cognitive behavioral therapy, acupuncture, kinesio taping, and balance training can all be considered as options for these patients. Um, I particularly like to recommend exercises like yoga or other neuromuscular type exercises that improve strength and coordination for patients. I find that this really helps to protect the joint from aggravations and seems to make a big difference for them. Now looking at the pharmacologic options, we know that an NSAID therapy has been a mainstay for osteoarthritis for a long time. The key factor here is even though they're strongly recommended, that oral non steroidal options have to be curtailed in people who have cardiovascular risks, renal disease, previous history of GI bleeding, or other sensitivities to NSAIDs in general. And so this obviously limits the options for some patients. Topical NSAIDs in particular have been shown to be effective for knee osteoarthritis and to a certain extent in hand osteoarthritis. And so it received a conditional recommendation for hand osteoarthritis. Corticosteroids, especially with either imaging guidance uh, or other guidance to ensure that it's intraarticular seems to be the most effective option. And so, um, and this was strongly recommended for knee osteoarthritis and not so much in, in the hand with some potential caveats that in people who don't have swelling with their osteoarthritis in the hands, that corticosteroids might not be as effective. And so it only received a conditional recommendation for that. Acetaminophen has a small, potentially non-clinically meaningful effect, although that can be patient specific. 
Tramadol is the only opioid that was recommended and all other opioids were actually recommended against. And duloxetine, which is a, a, an SNRI, uh, has certainly been shown to be effective. I find that duloxetine is really the most effective in people who have late stage disease and have atypical neuropathic kinds of pain. So shooting pain, nocturnal pain, burning pain around the knee, for example, seems to be the most effective. And so duloxetine was conditionally recommended in this. Um, topical capsaicin will come up again as we talk about capsaicin a bit later. Not recommended, strongly recommended uh, against using TENS. Um, other therapies that have been studied and shown not to achieve a clinically meaningful benefit include things like massage therapy, modified shoes, or wedged insoles as well. And a number of pharmacologic options have also been strongly recommended against, and these include bisphosphonates, glucosamine, and DMARDs like hydroxychloroquine and methotrexate and TNF inhibitors, uh, as well as interleukin-1 receptor antagonists. These have all been studied in large clinical trials and shown not to be effective. There may be an exception when it comes to methotrexate in the evidence, which I'll, I'll allude to in a bit. PRP and stem cell injections are very investigational at this point, and because of potential harms have been, uh, or, or lack of cost effectiveness, have not been recommended again in this set of guidelines. Um, other intraarticular therapies like intraarticular hyaluronic acid were either conditionally not recommended or strongly not recommended. Um, colchicine was studied in the Colchris trial um, and the Colcoa trial, and the Colcoa trial was negative for their primary outcome, and so colchicine is, is not recommended. So the 2019 American College of Rheumatology guidelines do update with a nice evidence-based review of what we should be doing with our patients. And it's important to remember that these are really designed to describe practice patterns. It's not mandatory to follow these. You have to tailor the, the care to your patient uh, individually, uh, as I alluded to. And, and remember that especially the treatments that aren't offered will not work. And I find that patients often with osteoarthritis uh, do not necessarily receive all treatment options. Um, and so that, that needs to be uh, a key priority for us, uh, both in rheumatology as in other areas of care. So I mentioned that potentially DMARDs would not be effective for osteoarthritis. So I wanted to touch on why that may be. Um, there was a systematic review done in 2018 that looked at a number of randomized control trials that looked at conventional and uh, biologic DMARDs that were studied specifically for knee and hand osteoarthritis. So this comprised 11 well-designed RCTs with over 1,200 patients, and they looked at different DMARDs. Essentially, they, they found that overall, that the, the treatment was only slightly favored, and it did not meet that clinically meaningful threshold. And so even though the effect size was toward the active treatment, it was such a small difference and really led mostly by uh, one or two outlier studies that overall conventional synthetic and biologic DMARDs did not seem to make a substantial difference for patients with osteoarthritis of the hands or knees. So as I mentioned, a very small effect size, 0.18, where you would like to see at least a 0.5 effect size uh, for it to be um, particularly meaningful. What about specific DMARDs? Well, hydroxychloroquine for hand osteoarthritis has been used for, for many, many years. Um, and finally, the HERO trial, which was done in the United Kingdom uh, by Sarah Kingsbury and other uh, colleagues with, uh, Phil, working with Phil Conahan, uh, looked at 248 patients who had radiographic and symptomatic hand osteoarthritis, and they conducted a, a double-blind placebo-controlled RCT of hydroxychloroquine up to a pretty high dose, 6.5 milligrams per kilogram per day, and, uh, and followed these patients for six months to see if this could modify hand pain. And effe effectively what they found was that not only overall was there no effect on modifying hand pain, so there was no difference between the placebo and the hydroxychloroquine groups at six months, um, it didn't really matter either whether you looked at specific subgroups, so whether they had mild to moderate structural damage or severe damage in the hands, uh, measured by radiographs, or whether this looked at uh, patients with or without power Doppler on ultrasound imaging, there was no modification of their pain outcomes. And so overall, hydroxychloroquine is probably not an effective option for hand osteoarthritis. There may be some news coming though for, for methotrexate and knee osteoarthritis. And this is an abstract presented at the American College of Rheumatology from the PROMOTE trial. So in this case, a randomized controlled trial of methotrexate for late stage osteoarthritis. And what they found was that this actually did improve 
pain outcomes for patients with a standard effect size of 0 0.36. So a moderate effect size, not very strong, um, but still was able to reduce pain. And I think that this speaks to further investigation that may need to be done. So they were actually able to improve pain, stiffness, and function on multiple secondary outcomes as well. And I think uh, we're really waiting for this trial to be published so that we can see uh, the data uh, after the peer review process. I think this also outlines the importance of considering when we intervene for osteoarthritis. The patients in that trial were really late to end stage osteoarthritis, patients with calgren lorentz grade three or four. Um, on the other hand, we potentially could make the most difference if we intervene much earlier in the stage of disease. And so this is where we need to have criteria that help us define early stage osteoarthritis much better. So what's in the pipeline for osteoarthritis as, uh, as we wrap things up for today? Well, first of all, probably the most exciting advance is uh, the focus on trying to improve cartilage outcomes for osteoarthritis. We know right now that the FDA has defined a disease modifying drug for osteoarthritis as that being one that can both improve symptoms as well as structure. So you have to be able to at least stop the advancement of joint space narrowing on a radiograph or improve it, meaning increase that joint space again. That's a very tall order, and especially because radiographs are not very sensitive to change, it's a particularly challenging way to proceed. So this is being revised at the FDA in terms of what the structural endpoints for drug studies need to be, um, and we're really hoping for some further guidance on that soon. But in that vein, trying to improve cartilage thickness, there's long been this research looking at how cartilage grows and is maintained. And we know during development that Cartilage forms as a result of chondrocyte proliferation. And then if bones are being formed from the cartilage template, this goes through endochondral ossification and becomes hypertrophic chondrocytes and then calcified chondrocytes before ultimately being replaced by bone. However, a molecule called FGF18, which signals through the fibroblast growth factor receptor three, can arrest this process so it can stop uh, cartilage from being replaced by bone and sustain it in an articular cartilage like phenotype. And so people have thought that FGF18 might be a way of, of improving cartilage health, especially in osteoarthritis. So the forward study was a randomized controlled trial of FGF18 versus placebo and also at different doses to see whether this could improve cartilage outcomes for people with knee osteoarthritis. And it was designed with a placebo control group as well as two different doses and two different frequencies of spurferman, which is the recombinant FGF18, um, given at either six month or 12 month intervals and followed out to a total of, of five years with the primary endpoint at two years. So the results of this study were positive in terms of the primary outcome, which was cartilage thickness. And so a pre-specified analysis, which was actually conducted at three years, was just reported at, uh, at the ACR this fall. And essentially what they found was that the group that got the highest dose and the most frequent dosing of spriferman had the greatest increase in cartilage thickness as measured by an MRI compared to the placebo group, which is the black line down here. And after the dosing, dosing finished at the two-year point, the cartilage started to thin again. So it did not shut off the process altogether, but it was able to overcome the osteoarthritic degradation process and actually thicken the cartilage. So this was a positive trial for osteoarthritis. What was interesting, though, is that it did not modify pain. And so looking at Womack pain scores, these were not different between the group that had improvements in their cartilage thickness and groups that, and the group that did not in the placebo group. So we were able to improve cartilage thickness, but not pain. So the forward trial gives us new hope that we can actually modify osteoarthritis. It's not necessarily pain modifying. And so that suggests that combination therapies may be needed to achieve the best outcomes in the future. I also wanna talk about pain then, because obviously this is the most common reason that patients uh, come to see us. And, and we mostly think about treating pain in the sensory discriminative domain. So trying to modify nociception with medications. However, it's important to remember that how patients think about their pain, if they see it as a potential threat, will amplify that experience. As well as if they have uh, depression or anxiety as a comorbidity, they may amplify the pain experience as well. And so lots of things need to be considered when treating pain. We also need to find a very selective target 
for pain modification. A lot of the drugs that we use, like NSAIDs that were mentioned earlier, have targets that are expressed in other tissues, like in the gut and the kidney. And so we really need a target in nerve tissue that's going to be much more selective for pain modification without a lot of other off-target effects. And so that's really the key priority right now. Some of the new developments that have happened are uh, intra-articular capsation for knee osteoarthritis. And this is selective for nerve tissue. TRIP-V1, which is the target of capsation, uh, is expressed predominantly in nerve tissues. In, in the, uh, the latest study that's been developed, they looked at capsation, which is a synthetic formulation, which was injected into patients' knees who have knee osteoarthritis versus a placebo. And they found that compared to the placebo, there was an, um, uh, an improvement uh, in pain at, uh, at the 12-week endpoint. Uh, in general, you would think of this as being particularly painful, so because capsation would cause burning. Um, however, they found this was particularly well tolerated if you cooled the knee uh, in advance of doing the injection, so icing of the knee before the injection was delivered. The second target, of course, is the anti-NGF uh, story, and this has been well known for the last 10 years and still being considered actually actively right now in front of the FDA. So nerve growth factor stimulates nerve endings uh, and increases nerve sensitization by upregulating the uh, receptors on nerves that, that increase their uh, firing rate and the intensity with which they fire in terms of nociceptors, so increased pain signaling. So NGF which is produced by uh, pro-inflammatory cells has been thought of as an ideal target to try to decrease pain and pain sensitivity, especially in patients with arthritis. There were three monoclonal antibodies developed against uh, NGF, and those included tenezumab, which is currently being considered before the FDA, as well as fosinumab and fulranumab. And about 10 years ago, there was a hold, the first of a series of holds placed on development programs because of concerns for uh, rapidly progressive osteoarthritis. And this was a key limitation and held back the program for some time um, and still continues to be uh, a, a consideration. So I'll briefly go through why that is. Um, ultimately, this was granted fast track status in, in 2017 and uh, as mentioned is, uh, is currently being considered uh, for approval. Essentially, what was found is that higher doses of tenezumab and higher doses in combination with NSAIDs increased the rates of people who developed rapidly progressive osteoarthritis. And so the highest doses in combination with NSAIDs here had the greatest number of events uh, per thousand patient years in terms of rapidly progressive OA. And so now the most recent trials have looked at the lowest doses of 2.5 and or 5 milligrams of tenezumab subcutaneous in the absence of NSAIDs. Um, one of the, the latest trials to be reported was reported in 2018 at the American College of Rheumatology, looking at the efficacy and safety of subcutaneous uh, biologic anti-NGF therapy with tenezumab for hip and knee osteoarthritis, um, was able to achieve its primary endpoint of pain reduction, um, but still had the, a small but important signal uh, for the rapidly progressive OA endpoints. So three in the tenezumab 2.5 milligrams group compared to the uh, placebo group and two in the, the type two progressive group compared to zero in the placebo group. So this is what's being balanced in terms of the consideration for, uh, for approval. So capsation can potentially be beneficial. We'll look to see more trials coming forward about that and anti-NGFs uh, is a, a program essentially finishing development and we'll see, hopefully that will be reported in 2021. Finally, I wanna talk about anti-cytokine therapy. Um, Anti-IL-1 therapy for osteoarthritis patients has been studied several times. The latest is uh, a dual anti-IL-1 alpha and beta therapy, which was uh, called lutekizumab and studied in patients with knee osteoarthritis who also had chronic synovitis confirmed by MRI or ultrasound. So this randomized trial I looked at three different doses of lutekizumab over a 52-week period in patients with osteoarthritis, and essentially this was a, a, a negative study. Um, they did not find a meaningful improvement in, in patients. 
However, the other piece of news is the Cantos study had a number of sub analyses that were performed. And one was looking at the risk of knee replacement in patients who were on canakinumab, a different anti-IL-1 therapy. Um, and uh, this was being studied for cardiac endpoints in a very large number of patients, but they also were able to do sub analyses. And so this was reported uh, at the American College of Rheumatology again in 2018 and found that patients who were on the canakinumab active therapy had a lower risk of knee replacement uh, over the entire study uh, follow-up period uh, compared to those who did not have an anti uh, interleukin one therapy with canakinumab. And so the jury is still out really about whether this is a, a confounder effect or whether this is truly a benefit of anti IL-1 therapy. So briefly, uh, interesting and new uh, anti-catabolic approaches have, have really not been terribly successful. We'll see what Cantos can tell us, but, uh, but I think the greatest exciting news here is that potentially anabolic approaches may be effective uh, as the Spifferman trial showed us. So overall, um, I, I think it's important to remember that as rheumatologists, we can't see all of the patients with osteoarthritis. There are simply too many and not enough of us, but we can lead and help our primary care and other providers who do see patients with osteoarthritis to follow the evidence base and, and provide goal-directed therapy for patients and not to give up too soon. I think we can also help manage the complex cult multimorbidity cases. And I think that we can help to dispel um, incomplete data or misinformation and fringe markets that sometimes our patients uh, really pursue. And finally, we really need to push the research agenda. This is a very um, undermet need in, in rheumatology. And I think it help, will help us improve the best interests of our patients if we can advocate for them. So the bottom line is uh, guidelines are available. They reflect the best options, but there uh, may be hope for the future. Probably not hydroxychloroquine, probably not anti-IL-1 therapy, uh, maybe methotrexate, and, um, and hope, hopefully uh, FGF-18 will have another trial to, to solidify these results and stay tuned for the anti-NGF therapy. Thank you so much for the opportunity. And again, I want to thank the organizers for, uh, for having me present, and I hope you enjoy the rest of Rumicon 2021.